don't need much convincing that the issues we talk about here are real and important and pressing and that artists are engaged in them as well. Um, but we all know people who aren't convinced of that. And so something like this might help. This is just uh, some NASA information from their FAQ site on climate change and the first question from their FAQs, if we immediately stopped emitting greenhouse gases, would global warming stop? Probably most of you know the answer, unfortunately, is no, but that doesn't mean there's no hope. We can reverse some of the damage, but we have to act right away. So um, climate events on SUNY ADK campus is the flyer over there also. And now I can go. <laughs> and our, what did I do? Our first reader is Stuart Bartow. Um, then we're going to have Jackie Craven, Lolly Davidson, Lee Gooden, David Graham, a video. Uh, I'll already mentioned read a poem to a child. I'll read you one of those poems briefly. Donna Hales, Jenny Hutchinson is going to talk about the Hides exhibits coming up. Um, Pat Leonard, uh, Bernice Menes, uh, yours truly, um, a brief video interlude. And then Carol Pines with uh, reading from, from Paul Pines. Um, Lucina Prosco is here. Mary Shardle and Barbara Unger. Um, and I'd ask everybody, if you don't mind, since I'm doing triple duty tonight, would you please just say a word about yourself and your poem as you come up? Uh, and welcome, Stu. Do I need this? Do I need this? Yes. yes, for the video, please. Video? For the video. Oh, wow. We're being filmed? Yes. Problem. Um, I'm applying for an artist grant, and on the grant, I'm supposed to explain, of course, it's to write, to write poetry, which is a very thing to write grant for anyway. I'm supposed to explain how the poetry that I'm going to write is going to affect the community. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I don't know. I know I uh, I'll think of something. Joy and you think they'll believe that if I write that? I'm just like, uh, this is getting better all the time. Any suggestions, people tell me. Uh, all right, I have uh, two poems. Bees came dropped into the black mouths of the poppies I had planted there. They bathed in black pollen, then struggled out and flew off like they had something important, like they had somewhere important to go. And they did, but I didn't follow. On that day, it was none of my business. My business was to have faith that they knew where to go. My business was to believe that they always know exactly what to do to keep the earth humming, which got me to thinking about us, what we are supposed to be doing. But this was a June morning for watching bees fall and rise out of flowers, keeping me busy. And this uh, is the whole shebang, it's called. I think it's an Irish phrase, shebang, the whole shebang. I used to hear it going up all the time. Before gravity was invented, the energy that holds the planets and moons in place, and anti-gravity expanding the cosmos, Dante claimed God's love to be the force turning the stars and heavenly bodies. Unknown 
the secret of attraction that guides atoms to molecules, to organisms shaping solar systems and galaxies, humans, mushrooms, moths, stars, minds, energy fields morphing into forms, dreamlike and stark, difficult to trace. Such a simple thing to step outside your door and perhaps someday to float away. Thank you. Raven. I will read a poem uh, from my book, Secret Formulas and Techniques of the Masters. And the poem is Dear light and lithe, springing over fallen logs through forests, legs striking ground away from Apollo, from his shining face, from sunfire burning under my skin when he approaches, from 
dark, wet urges, terrifying closeness, base smells. I flitted through the trees faster than moonlight. Yes, this was all I wanted. This here, now, lonely earth, scent of leaves, trees, my only friends, the true ones who serve without passion, who unite earth and sky, unthinking, who never hate or hunger or dangle their crying prey between claws in curious delight. Trees give and take in equal measure, clean, sublime, stronger than hurricanes, anchored yet pliant. Yes, I was right to run from Apollo. Somehow he caught me, his skin hot surrounded me, scent of hay, of sweat, flash of white teeth, eyes burning bright of the hottest day sky, his muscles musky golden felines across my back, voice surprisingly soft, purr of fire and lion, pleading, not rape. I twisted in his arms to get out, but ended up facing the sweet concave at the base of his neck, now drowning me. Even as my heart burst with terror, my vagina sprang, calescent river. For just a second, I could have melted, could have tongue to saltness merged, following the blood down into dark tunnel, into a world of flesh eaters, baby birthers, and pollution. Father, save me. Purity, my power, I pushed him away from me, a cataract tumbling backward, two steps and my thigh muscles weakened and wooden, my skin thickened, gray roughening to scale, my legs caught on each other, became one, torso lengthened, arms shot skyward, muscles cramped as they twisted around bone becoming branch, feet sprouted, roots probing earth swelling, pushing aside rock and soil, a grip of earth, a firm of firmament. Barely could I feel his arms around me now, beating on my hardening trunk. His cries faded as my ears vanished, pain drained as blood thinned and purified to sap, and with it all of blood's dark messages of desire, envy, fear, love, and hunger, most dangerous, de devious, and confusing of all, replaced by quiet, by orderly mineral messaging, a muttering of equations, a murmuring of measurements, equidistant and effervescing, directions on how to sprout branches, how to turn sun to sugar with my fingers, now leaves, language last to go, human, away the drain, where what of all words they're meaning from, Cambium, green under bark, phloem and xylem, coursing earth's ancient dictums, newly clear, branchifying to sunfit, down sink I to darkness, most planetary, most still, earth pull sky close and translate to oxygen breath, sweet, slow, I no more, but all mind, knowing and knowing until only sun humming I this. All right, so because I'm a playwright and a poet, and my feet don't show it, um, I like to I like to experiment with forms. I like to specifically for events like this, I like to do audience participation type stuff. So this is this is an experiment in form, and uh, the idea is I'm going to beat my chest, 
that rhythm, and you guys are going to repeat that rhythm. And keep that rhythm until I switch it. So we're all going to be human metronomes. <coughs> so we're going to start out like this. Good. Keep that up for a bit. Thank you. Part of the matter. Our cores were rocked by amniotic oceanic wounds. Our mothers were umbilical coral and plasma ties. We were one cell big bangers reaching for the dust moon stars and self awareness. We were the slime trailing bottom feeding insignificant, the original AI. But then there were things and guilts and respiration. We wanted to do more than divide to the mercy of ourselves. With effort ridden slithers, we left the kelp bed crests and peaks for harsher climbs. Stony beaches and razor blade grasses slit our tentacles and bruised our belly and brow. We turned our wandering faces to the sky and our wandering bodies to the dirt. We killed and ate our earthen brethren, fashioned bone and sinew tools, hunter gathering amongst superstitious forest beasts. We left blood and fertility offerings for clickbait oracles, the first alternative facts and fake news, creating gods and goddesses in our image with our technology and change with momentum and acceleration. We rotated our crops and crossbred howling wolves, their barking lunacy, meadow sheep, soil and scat was ours to shape and seed and scar, finagling agrarian roads for our future stories. Then, industrialization and science were new praises and prayers, smokestacks and slaughterhouses beat the clouds, boring holes to jungle hooky heavens, warring, corrupting, and polluting angels, where the wings were clipped and halos broke, and cannon boom thunderclap mushroom fallout was heard everywhere, eclipsing shadow, blocking light. They fell hard. And we fall to by default, pushing cinders aside. And rubble, we search for common sense. And these burnt out shells, charcoal frames, stand with no support of stability, just in grand wishes, dreams, and imagination. And now the waters take last gasps. Their acidic dead lungs spit and struggle as they warm and rise, killing our mothers and fathers, adulterating futures. These things shouldn't happen. First century, or any century for that matter, but it is happening. Does salvation lie in the uber advancements of science and technology? Will it lift us? I heard Elon Musk is collaborating with the Illuminati, the deep state, and Domino's to place a high diesel Hatchimal probes on the moon to harvest green cheese for pizza loving aliens in Area 51. It was on Facebook and Fox and Friends. I saw a deep fake video on TikTok. It must be true. <laughs> Everything is politicized, and whistleblowers and capitalism are demonized, and we roll and wallow in the ranting, stinking shit in the name of fear and ratings and entertainment. Still, can we crowdsource and kickstart the human, humane humanity and kindness of mankind? Can we pay pal as we beat our chest and forget the sabers? Imagine our heart and take over this room and spread over dear love and eyes and heart, contagious and rhythms. In fact, the stupid center and everyone faces time or instant messages is cardiac disease. This moment covers all of Lunds Falls in Queensbury, flows to South Lunds Falls, all the counties in New York State, even contaminates the big ass apple everyone talks about. The whole continent now echoes notes from the collected EKG STDs. We're singing from our diaphragms a song that is as catchy as a tune from Pharrell Williams, as catchy as a composition by the Beatles. Everyone around the world is cognizant of our fleshy metronomes, our last hurrah, our pleading and beseeching, organ pinned to our sleeves, pant legs, and thongs. Evolution is our birthright. Adaptation and intellect and compassion are superpowers. No more, no more pointing fingers at men and women in the sky or one percenter sitting high. It no longer matters why, when, when is inevitable. What matters is how, what matters is now, what matters is us. What matters is us. We are the heart of the matter. Thank you. My name is David Graham, and uh, I just learned that I'll never get a job as a percussionist. <laughs> Do I need to hold 
this closer? No? I'm all right. Um, I'm going to read one poem. It is uh, titled Sea Turtle, which tells you what it's about. But I, I want to say just a, a couple brief things. Um, when I sent this poem off to Kathy, uh, I was a little startled when I looked at it again and uh, realized I wrote it nearly 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. And the striking thing to me was that it's still relevant uh, and, and striking and sad as well. Uh, sea turtles, as you may well know, uh, been around, we think, for at least 100 million years. But whether or not they'll still be here in 100 years is an open question. They were 40 years ago, and they are now very much endangered. And the reason for that endangerment is, of course, us. Uh, we didn't hear much of the phrase global warming or the phrase climate change 40 years ago, but uh, the issues were the same. Uh, they're being threatened by poaching, by uh, <coughs> overfishing, they're being uh, threatened by plastics in the ocean, and of course habitat destruction. Uh, one of the things I, I learned when writing this poem was that uh, I, I think, I don't know if it's all species, but some species of sea turtle are programmed uh, to go back to the beach where they were hatched uh, and, and lay their eggs there. And so when you build a condo or a resort on that beach, or if that beach isn't there anymore, is washed away by the latest hurricane, you got a problem. So anyway, uh, in this poem, I was interested to see if I could bring together the biological scientific facts with some of the rich uh, mythology and legend that uh, are, is associated with uh, sea turtles. Sea turtle. Deep in your oyster-sized brain is a hatred for sharks, hunger for jellyfish and crabs, perfect memory for the sands of the hatching beach. Your bad luck with that barnacle mouth plucking ice age sponges from bottom mud, nearsighted cooter of the coral reefs. They say you drum a storm on boat decks, but you'll die lunging after plastic bags, jaw thick with fish hooks you've eaten the bait from. Your young will crawl toward the light they think is moonlit sea, pavement glittering with headlights. A jeep will eat the eggs ghost crabs cannot find. You'll butt your nose raw on aquarium walls, snap dangled fingers like snail shells. With breath so foul, the shrimp men gag, about a limitless gut, carapace sharp enough to sh slice their nets and free a day's catch. You're swimming to beaches that have washed away. They say turtle steak won't rest in the pan, that it takes you a week to die. They have seen you, three-legged from old shark bites, climb crookedly out of the surf, straight into a poacher's machete. They have seen you headless, dropping eggs.
and it was a reference to the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement, which is going to expire at the end of 2020. So, next we have Donna Hills. to look where we must invest. Brazil is on fire, and so too is Peru. Paraguay also burns. Bolivia is in there too. The Congo is ablaze. Angola and Zambia raise. Mozambique, Gabon, Cameroon almost erased. As the world burns, we calculate the cost if America is untouched. Is there any loss? As the world burns, we wring our hands in distress. We walk away with tear-filled eyes after we beat our breasts. As the world burns, we continue to clear the land. We cut down trees and choke our birds in service to the man. As the world burns, we rejoice at what we build. We rape the land, pollute the soil. This is our given will. As the world burns, we worship the holy dollar. We prostrate ourselves and sing its praise with communities left in squalor. As the world burns, we eagerly close our ear to the clarion call that bids us come to rescue all in fear. And still, the world burns. museum here in Once Falls, uh, located on Warren Street, just in case you're not familiar with us. Um, some people do drive by and wonder what we are. <laughs> so, uh, we're a historic house and our museum, and um, one of the things that we have special happening uh, this fall is we're hosting artists in the Mohawk Hudson region, uh, and our guest juror was uh, Victoria Palermo for that. Uh, so this is a uh, yearly competition that any artist within 100 miles uh, can uh, submit works for, and it's shared between the High Collection, the Albany Institute, and uh, SUNY Albany. And uh, one of the things that uh, Victoria found, uh, we had more than 500 submissions, it was the largest in quite a few years, is the artists were overwhelmingly responding to concerns with climate change. Uh, so she has selected 80 works that indeed um, deal with those topics in some way. Um, some are directly related, um, dealing with um, kind of future past or present. Uh, some are even artist imaginings as well. Uh, so these are all artists who are kind of seeking to transform our lives. And um, you know, as Kathy noted, art really does have the ability to do that. And uh, so do your creative voices as well. Um, so thank you for inviting me today to be part of it. Um, and, I, and I hope you'll come over to see the exhibition. It opens on uh, October 12th, um, and it runs until December 4th. And we're going to be hosting a series of special events. Um, Mr. Bartow, you, you mentioned earlier how do you share these messages with the community. And one of the ways we do that, the High Collection, is through the voice of programming. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that we're doing is I, I hope um, some of you might submit some poetry for us to uh, place on a mobile app that can be read alongside these amazing artworks. Uh, we're also hosting uh, Victoria Palermo with Bill McKibben on October 12th uh, as part of the opening day festivities. Uh, we're also hoping to uh, host a poetry reading, which again, I hope you consider coming to uh, the following day on Sunday, October 13th. 
And then we'll also be uh, hosting the artists through a series of discussions. Uh, so Wednesday, starting October 16th, and then we'll also have an artist panel on November 10th uh, that will feature artists specifically addressing those topics. Uh, so thank you for letting me take a moment of your time and uh, congratulations to all of you uh, today. Today, 
It began with me watching his huge bullet gracefully moving through frigid waters, like the seals he saw. But he could not swim forever, needed solid ice from which to hunt. In the melting Arctic, hard to find a place to stand. After many hours and miles, he finally reached a small piece of land where walruses, hundreds, thousands, were huddled together. He slept for a long time, weary. The more I looked, the smaller he appeared, his white body almost disappearing on the large white canvas. When he awoke, desperate with hunger, he tried to enter the tight circle of walrus mothers and babes. Of course, I'm always rooting for mother and child, her courage and their vulnerability. But this time, I could feel my heart shift to the exhausted polar bear, having followed him for so many miles as he struggled. His claws not long or strong enough, despite his many attempts to penetrate the walrus's tough hides. He tried again and again, then exhausted and bloody, gave up, curled into himself on the snow and waited to die, this huge carnivore, now looking so small, my heart went out to him, whom I disliked when he stalked his own small babes and hunted fiercely, this king of the Arctic. But just to say I never liked kings, always rooted for the peasants, he now, like a peasant, thrown off the only land he knew, the ice slowly melting and the way of life slowly disappearing, and me on the sidelines and in the middle, rooting for bounty, for beauty, for life.
the limb from which they'd one day spring to life. I had no idea that a mother's body could grow soot in the wet nest of her womb, that the cord linking mother and child could siphon soot, blacken eyes. Daughter among the oaks, let sprout green leaves for hair, absorb the scent of balsam. Our legs will go brown in the shade, our arms green, and for my babies who never breathed, we shall become the green watcher women. song now that was uh, from Scientific American. Um, guy rewrote the words to You Are My Sunshine for the purpose of Earth Day. To our new series, Scientific American Songs. Let's, uh, let's do your new version. Okay. Right? Yeah. Same style, but maybe uh, yeah. some surprises. Yeah, some, some, different, <laughs> some different lyrics inspired by your direction and your uh, confidence in, in me and us to come up with something new and uh, conscious about our planet and the way we need to treat her. Starts very similar to the last version. <laughs>
played about two minutes of. It's, it's a piece that we played in the beginning when we were waiting for people to arrive. Um, it's based on climate science data uh, taken from, I don't know, I think 133 years. And uh, as, as the year, it starts in the 19th century, and as the dates progress, the high notes represent, um, the higher notes represent the uh, higher temperatures, and the lower notes represent the lower temperatures. So as you get closer to today, <laughs> the pitch goes up. in a smoking mirror. He had uh, he spent a lot of, of um, imaginative time um, immersed in the mythology of Mesoamerica. And the name of this poem is Mother Earth. And I think, uh, I don't think it needs much <laughs> my introduction. Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca descended to find Mother Earth, a many-limbed monster moving over water, a mouth at the articulation of every limb. Becoming serpents, they twisted and pulled her apart to create land and sky, both of which cried, remembering their origin. Upset, the gods tried to make amends by creating men from her unused meat, grass, trees, and flowers from her hair, Meadows full of wild spices from her skin, valleys and volcanoes from her nose, caves from her mouth and from her eyes, fountains and wells. Still, her tears fell. And to this day, she refuses to bloom or bear fruit until she slaked her thirst for blood, eaten her fill of human hearts. uncharted territories of our habitat, to sing to you and away, as if the night entered my throat and lay there in silence to be opened, or to swallow the world itself, honey-scented gardens, porches circled by bats, yellow flickering lights in square windows, to play into joyfulness, stretch the wings, and splash water everywhere, to banter with an otter or a dog, so that the true essence of us can show itself in unearthly laughter, to come close to shores but move away cautiously, to overtake the domain of sunsets and solitary mornings, to observe with curiosity to announce the darkness to the light, and to pour the light into the swirls of darkness. Let the song join us across time, outside of time, into the unending ripples from which we come. survive 
this reading, I'm going to do a rendition of, of Marlena Dietrich to a school with boys in the back room. <laughs> um, this is a late stage bronchitis. Um, I'm an Adirondack writer, and um, this poem is called Blue Mountain Lake Overlook. So I spend a lot of time thinking and writing and being in the Adirondacks. So if you've ever been to the museum in blue, now called the Adirondack Experience. Um, it had a tuna fish salad sandwich in the cafeteria. You might recognize this. It begins with an epigraph proper or a collect, which is a little tiny prayer that's given every Sunday through the Book of Common Prayer. And they're dated. So this one is the collect or proper 20 for the Sunday closest to September 22nd. It's usually just a short prayer concerned with one topic and used for a particular day or season in the liturgical calendar. The collect reads, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to cleave to those that shall abide. Blue Mountain Lake Overlook. Museum cafeteria, indifferent to the salad, I'm sitting on the fringe, knowing I may never afford the lakeside camp. A good rod, yellow lab, but I own this view. As I have from Lake Mohegan, Faro Mountain, Hadley Mountain, my knees and back too stiff now to paddle, face a peak, still there are campfires. <laughs> Who will lose whom? The mountains meet, or me, the mountains. Drifting, blurred, blue across the lake. The ephemeral pines, vulnerable waters, tragic looms, fellable otters, scruffy, tick-eyed deer. Cohen's hardware will pass on. Uncas and Sagamore as well. La Bastille's failing, they say. All of us like those sturdy mossy plots of family stone, overgrown and weary of another season. I fear the worst, the ignorance of ignorance. We leave behind these outsized treasures to unknown, untried hands and poor words. Thank you. Hi, I'm Barbara Unger, and I'm going to read the title poem for my new book. It's called Save Our Ship. It's um, an alphabet book, and I call it Hashtag Me Too Meets Global Weirding. Um, so this is, one of, uh, this is one of the S poems. A few things, uh, a few weird references in it. Merck Crone. Um, my sisters were at the ocean with Stu and me a few years back, and we were all swimming past him as he, he was fishing in his kayak, and he said, oh, mermaids. And one of my sisters said, no, mer crones. <laughs> so, yeah, it's not a whole new word, mer crone. Yeah. The, the Fisher King is in there, too. I'm not sure if that's a reference to Stu or possibly the Wasteland. <laughs> I promise this poem is not anywhere near as long as the Wasteland. It is a bit fragmentary, a little bit of... Um, found stuff going on here from the New York Times Magazine section a few years back that was on rising ocean tides. Um, one other thing I think Stu might be the last American who doesn't have an iPhone. He still has a clamshell. And on that same trip, his clamshell, which he kept in a plastic bag in his pocket, the kayak got away. He had to dive in. He got the kayak. He lost the cell phone. So the assignment was right poem about, you know, what happens to the cell phone at the bottom of the ocean. So that is the genesis of this poem. Save our ship. Your clamshell rings and rings, wrapped in sea green plastic. Murkrum calling Fisher King. 
the number you are calling has a voice mailbox that has been deluged. <laughs> <coughs> a drowned sailor picks up crusts of dried salt in the streets. You're breaking up. The tide of pink jellyfish, big as washing machines, rises. Oceans, hurricane voice calling back could crush your skull. Wake up, wake up, wake up. You've overslept. All your calendars are drowned. The only road is disappearing beneath the sea. The inundation of the coast has begun. The sea is now so near the brim. SOS, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 dot. Dash, dash, dash.